When I think of 2003, all I see freeze-framed in my mind are the pictures I took at my lowest weight, gaunt and sunken with short cherry red hair and the thousand-yard stare of a corpse. But no one in my family ever, ever, not once, said a word. No shock, no concern, nothing. So I just thought, how bad can it really be if even my mom doesn't seem worried enough to care? Would they only get it once I was dead? But while all this was going on, while I was shedding the recovery weight and puking myself inside out, something else was entering my life too. Everything was about to change. So hello you wonderful people and welcome back to another chapter of the Nostalgia Project. I apologise for my room being all in the background of this video. It is a sweltering freaking day and if I don't have the airflow I am going to melt and die. So this chapter, it does flow on from the last chapter as chapters tend to, which means I do need to give you another eating disorder trigger warning. I would not say it's as triggering as the last chapter was, However, I do have to mention numbers in this chapter, only in a vague sense, not a specific number, but I couldn't leave it out because it was direct speech. It was exactly what someone said to me, so I kind of needed to leave it in. I will leave a timestamp for that below if you want to dodge that bit, and I will also leave a timestamp for where the ED content is because it's not the whole of this chapter this time. The end of this chapter comes out of the eating disorder stuff finally and um, gets to the bits of this story that I really wanted to get to all the way through. I've been enjoying this whole process, but... The bit that's at the end of this chapter and where we go after this chapter is the bit of my life that I had so much fun with and that I can't wait to tell you about. So if you don't want to see any eating disorder stuff, check the timestamp below and you can hop to the very end and just have a smidgen of where we're going next time. Oh, and the final thing I need to tell you is that if you missed the last chapter, you won't be familiar with the eating disorder forum that... I was a member of back in the day. For anonymity's sake, I've called it the skinny place, the SP. Um, it Most people would call it a pro-anorexia forum. To be fair, it was a pro-anorexia forum, but its official statement was that it was pro-acceptance. So we take recovered people, we take people who want to be recovered, we take people who want to get sicker. Anyone is welcome. This was kind of the motto. But back in the day when we were all young, it was a very pro-anorexia forum, but it was such an important part of my life at the time. I had just dumped my amazing boyfriend, moved out of his house, moved back to my parents' place in this crappy little town that I hated, and no one in my real life understood why I had done that. But I had the girls at the SP, and they understood, and they really kept me going through this kind of horrible, momentous shift of having lived independently for nearly two years, and then coming back home to be with your parents when you've, you've got an eating disorder that's a very secretive disorder and suddenly you're back with your parents. At that point it was both of my parents and my little brother. So a busy house of people, hard to avoid. Oh my god, thank god for the girls at the SP, they kept me sane. So that's what I'm talking about when I say the SP and I think that's the final thing I needed to mention before we start. So without further ado, this chapter was inspired by a Bauhaus song in the title. So it is called All We Ever Wanted Was Everything, All We Ever Got Was Cold, The ED Years. So uh, I'm going to stop waffling and start reading. Here we go. <laughs> when I think of 2003, all I see freeze-framed in my mind are the pictures I took at my lowest weight, gaunt and sunken with short cherry red hair and the thousand-yard stare of a corpse. Those anorexic years don't belong in this book. Not really, but they're unavoidable. Part of the journey, part of what came next. So here comes the blood-slicked spill of secret organs, slippery pieces of a messy past scattered like the brief gore shock of roadkill across these pages, a short but gruesome splatter in a far longer highway. I don't remember the day I moved home from ashes, another thing I blanked from my memory. I do remember the newly located binge food situation being every bit as bountiful as I'd hoped, gorging myself on fish and chips, then throwing it all up again whenever my family went out. The trouble with fish and chips was the smell, you see. You couldn't sneak fish and chips up to your room. 
do it subtly. You had to wait for an empty house, do your thing, then push all the paper wrapping deep, deep into the trash before going insane with the air freshener. Not to cover the smell of puke, but to cover the indescribably gorgeous, undeniably British scent of battered fish and chips. A meal my entire family knew I would never in a month of Sundays eat without puking back up again. So, air freshener. But not enough that you were clearly covering a crime. And I never knew how far to go with covering up bulimic crimes, if I'm honest. I started noticing the splashback, which was our word at the SP, for the puke that bounces back out the toilet at you with every gush. Lovely, isn't it? The splashback was building up on the bathroom walls, but if I, an 18-year-old, was to randomly clean the family bathroom sparkling, wouldn't that look suspicious as all fuck? So I just left it there. And about two weeks later, I got up in the morning to find my mum scrubbing my puke off the walls and glaring at me. I went back to bed, mortified. That year I got down to my lowest weight, a number we won't be mentioning here for the sake of needless, dangerous competition. But I knew it was low and I liked it. I posted pictures to the ED forum often, charting my progress, pictures which would eventually be stolen and shared all around the net to pop up in Bonespo threads even now, 18 years later. How bizarre is that? The spectral photographic imprint of my anorexic self will likely outlive me. Anyway, they say you should never comment on an ED person's weight, and I say bullshit. I reckon I owe my life to the forum girls commenting on my body that it was too thin, too far, even for us. Because no one at home ever said a word. I'd arrived back from ashes fairly well emaciated and gone on to become extremely so. But no one in my family ever, ever, not once, said a word. No shock, no concern, nothing. So I just thought, how bad can it really be if even my mum doesn't seem worried enough to care? I hadn't figured out just yet that she has this infuriating habit of talking to Jesus instead of the person she actually needs to say the words to. I know for a fact I would have gone far, far further had it not been for the clarifying comments of the ED Forum members, their reassurance that it was enough, that I was enough. My family took a trip to Italy that year, 2003. I remember a lot about Italy. All of it disordered, yet somehow I kind of miss it. The hot, endless nights, the way you can never sleep when you're that starved. At first, starvation tires you out, makes you sleep better, but eventually it flips on its head and say hi to 4am. Even back home, the insomnia sucked. I didn't have my own computer yet, so I couldn't just get on the SP and chat away. I spent my midnights locked in the bathroom with laxative cramps, or counting the pennies scattered across my bedroom floor, or even paring my fucking socks. In Italy, I spent those humid 4am's crouched on the red-tiled floor of the converted monastery we were staying at. No sounds by the crickets out in the vineyards beyond the window, the night air horribly stuffily warm. I'd be picking at my legs, my arms, my eyebrows, anything I could pick at. It's always been a boredom habit of mine. And the boredom was intense at that old monastery, Borgo Monastero. It was a gorgeous place, though. All jagged grey stone like a castle, vineyards spilling out in all directions, a classic Italian restaurant just below our apartment, swimming pools further on, and the light you get in the late afternoon in Italy is like honey, like amber, like magic. But the place had no internet and only one chattering Italian TV. There was nothing to do but be trapped inside your head, inside your disorder unless I fancied getting into a car full of my family and trekking around on tourist expeditions, which would basically be autistic hell. I preferred to stay home and be bored. I remember everything. The golden sunsets, the lonesome nights, the enormous, repulsive, eggplant-coloured millipede scuttling its alien legs across the bathroom floor at 5am. But mostly, I remember the arriving. 
arriving caused a shitstorm I will never forget, nor easily forgive. We'd arrived exhausted from two flights, then a crazy drive up the mountain, some of us more so than others, having survived that long, long day on just a tin of carrots, one apple, and several pseudoephedrine pills. When we finally reached our lodgings, I was the first in, and the first to discover that our little stone apartment had one less bedroom than was promised. I had only agreed to come on the condition that I would have my own bedroom, which most people would find quite reasonable, me being the only girl. But the real thing was, I never slept, did I? I spent most of my days in my room thinking or daydreaming, journaling or picking my legs apart, adding up calories, maybe even binge purging. I needed my own room, and now I was stranded hundreds of miles from home, an ocean from home, and I didn't have anywhere to call my own. It was a fucking disaster. We went to the owner to make sure we were in the right apartment. We were. Did they have a bigger one? They did not. Everything was booked up. Fuck. My brothers were exasperated. Why did it even matter if I had to share a bedroom with one of them? There were enough beds. Don't be so ridiculous. They didn't understand how important private space was to me or to any autistic. So I scoped the place out and realised there were three bathrooms, proper ones, all with everything a bathroom could ever need. And a bathroom was far better than being homeless. So I dragged the first of my bags into the middle-sized one and announced, amid the ongoing bedroom dilemma hubbub, that I'd found a solution. I just needed a mattress and then I would sleep in the bath. It seemed a perfectly reasonable solution to me. The bath was big, I was skinny, chuck a mattress in, and it'd do just fine. Outside the bathroom door, however, my already frazzled family erupted into a blazing row. You are not sleeping in the bath, Dorian, my mum said with exasperation. We'll just move the beds and the boys can all be in one room. You can have the... Oh, come on, exclaimed the brother I... Well, the brother I previously liked... She's being ridiculous. We are not moving the beds just for you. Don't be so bloody selfish for once in your life. I am not asking you to move the beds, am I? I snapped through the door. I'm going to sleep in the bath. It's fine. Just stop arguing and bring me a mattress. No, mum stated, we're moving the beds. Grab the other end, someone. We'll just... Oh, yes. Everyone has to live in total discomfort for Dorian, as usual, came my brother's voice again. My God, she is so selfish. Why can't you just... I do not want you to move the fucking beds, I screamed through the door. Just bring me a mattress. I heard the grinding of a bed being moved. Then my aforementioned brother butted in again with, I cannot believe you are all pandering to this crap. She is a fully grown woman, and yet she's every bit as selfish as ever. Just grow up, Dorian. She's having a very hard time at the moment, I heard my mum retort, but nobody else said a word in my favour. Fully grown woman? I thought, seething, tears stinging behind my eyes, nails ripping at the skin of my arm, stranded in this stupid foreign country with these inescapable assholes who didn't get any of what I was going through and who genuinely did not seem to care. Fully grown woman, are you blind? I weigh as much as a goddamn five-year-old, you stupid fat fuck. And when did 18 years old become a fully grown woman? I wish I'd yelled that right through the door, because honestly, I fully agree with myself, even now. You know where you see the term fully grown women tossed about like popcorn at the movies? It's on a forum I won't even deign to name, which makes its entire living ripping mentally ill and or alternative females to bits. Even if they're 16 years old and weigh nothing at all, they're still a fully grown woman living in mummy's basement. Telling someone with a disorder that is all about fearing adulthood, regressing into childhood, that they are fully grown and need to grow the fuck up and snap out of their stupid, selfish, edied behaviours is a disgusting, grotesque, dumb fuck of a comment. And that was the day my brother would show his true colours for the first time. Don't worry. I got my revenge seven years later by not attending his wedding. To my family, though, I'm still the one in the wrong. 
because apparently the bloated, ribbon-bedecked, overpriced narcissism of wedding demands is a far worse thing to reject than someone's near-death mental health struggles. Whatever. That comment was a glimpse inside my brother's mind, and his mind, it turned out, was a page from the misogynistic, ableist sewers of the internet. There's no forgiving that. Ever. I was still locked in that alien bathroom as the battle of words raged on. My selfishness, my immaturity, my womanness, all vastly uncomfortable things to an 18-year-old anorexic, trying desperately to shrink back to childhood, still unaware of their own autism and queerness. I strode towards the window at the end of the rectangular, tiled room, desperate for any escape, pushed it as far open as it would go into the balmy Italian night, readying myself to jump out, then run and run till I was lost in the dark of the woods. Anything to escape my family and this fucking row. If I died out there, so much the better. Maybe that was the only way to get through to these pig-headed fucks that I was actually suffering, not just being a brat. Would they only get it once I was dead? I leaned out into the warm night air, grabbing the window frame and twisting my body through the small space. Till I looked down and realised it was a two-storey drop, at least, onto hard, irregular cobbles. Not enough distance to leap to my death, but definitely enough to jump out, break both ankles, then run precisely nowhere. I cursed under my breath, slammed the window, and began digging in my bag for something to butcher myself with. I only had my travel bags with me, though, not the one with my razor in it. And the best I could do, the best I could fucking do, as my entire family turned on me like a pack of hyenas on bath salts, was a wooden toothpick that I stabbed and stabbed into my arm with all my strength and barely even managed to draw blood. I wanted to explode. I wanted to implode, just disappear in there like a dying star. Anything to escape these goddamn people in this godforsaken disaster of a holiday. There was no internet, like I said. No SP girls to rant to, no one who understood how it was to be anorexic, depressed, autistic, utterly alone amidst your own family. No one to share in-jokes with, no food shops to browse, no binge food hidden in my bottom drawer. I got my solo bedroom in the end, but I felt like an alien, like a literal alien, vibrating on a different frequency to my entire family, which, of course, I was. My brain was so starved it was moving in slow motion. No one and nothing made sense to me. The things they talked about and enjoyed meant nothing to me. All I could concentrate on were food and weight loss. Every day I would emerge from my room as soon as my family left, go down to the little cafe to buy a Coke Light, the European version of diet. That was my breakfast, fizzing sweet chemical caffeine in a shiny silver can, or hot, heftily sweetened Irish cream-flavoured boater's coffee steaming in the slanting sunshine from the many windows overlooking the restaurant's cobbled patio. In the evenings, the smells of pizza, pesto and red wine would drift up to our windows, along with the chatter and laughter of the normal folk enjoying their holidays, eating together. I would usually stay in my room with a salad while my family went out to eat, my mum had this running joke that I was hanging back to see my secret Italian boyfriend. It was a twisted joke, really. Anorexia kills your desire for any of those things, and looking like this, what sane guy would be sexually attracted to me? I looked like a Holocaust victim, for Christ's sake. Some days, only when my family were gone, because God forbid they see me in a bathing suit, scars and all, I went down to the pool in my blue bikini. Everyone stared. And I mean, they fucking stared. It was bizarre at first. I wasn't goffed up, was I? What were they looking at? Eventually, I had to concede that maybe I was thin enough to be stared at. And at that point, I was nearly overtaken by the desire to fling my stick arms in the air, dance a weird skeletal jig and howl, I am the thin white duke. Anything to lessen the awkwardness of those unabashed stares of horror. I loved the swimming pool, though. I mean, swimming is hard when you have zero body fat. Fat floats. Fat keeps you afloat. And when you have none, you tend to sink like a stone, besides lacking the energy or muscle tone to swim at all. But once you got out, you could lie in the hot, glorious Italian sunshine. 
with another ice cold can of Coke Light, your favorite fucking food, sitting next to you. And at that point, I'd think I could live here forever. Imagine how thin I could get if I lived here. It's so easy to not eat when you're never cold. I still love to live somewhere hot with a pool, and it's true. I always lose weight in that climate, in those places. I lived on salad, endless tedious salad, with the occasional chunk of watermelon or an oversized juice dribbling peach. Apart from the two blissful nights my family went out to eat. Those nights, they were my party nights. My mum could joke about the Italian boyfriend all she liked, but there were things I wanted far, far more than some tall, dark and handsome. The first night, I went down to the cafe and instead of yet another Coke light or a miserable green salad, I asked for an entire ice cream cake. The one with its picture on the wall. He said, no, not now, we have none. So I had to go with three small tubs of gelato. God only knows what the guy thought. Fuck knows whether he told my parents. The Italians didn't seem to understand eating disorders at all. Their culture is so woven into and around good food and wine. It took so much explaining every time, every restaurant, just to get a salad that was green and plain, not covered in mozzarella and pesto and olive oil. Anyway, I got the goods that night scored the illicit wares and returned to our rooms with a bag full of the best ice cream in the entire world. Like, fuck, I mean it. Gelato is delicious. If you haven't tried it, you have not lived. Cappuccino, chocolate, even the vanilla, they were thicker and creamier and just more than any ice cream I'd ever tasted. I topped up my mini binge with a few bowls of Kellogg's cornflakes and then... This is the really gross part. I stole the fruit bowl, locked myself in one of the toilets, put the fruit bowl in the toilet bowl and puked into it. Why, you ask? Was this some continued vendetta against my family? No, when I wanted to get back at someone, I'd brush my puke teeth with their toothbrush. Something I only ever did once and I'm not even telling you who to. The reason for this vomity perversion of the fruit bowl was that I was now so paranoid about getting everything out of my stomach when I purged, I had to see the puke. It couldn't just disappear down the toilet, not without my checking that everything was actually there. Told you it was gross. Anyway, once I was done, I'd wash the thing up really well, then just put it back, <laughs> fruit and all. It's probably still there now, serving vacationing families, perhaps still secretly traumatised by the memory of the nights it was downgraded to a teenage anorexic sick bucket. When we finally got back to the frigid grey skies of England, I slipped straight into the toilets at Birmingham International Airport and ate seven chocolate x lax. If any product on earth was made specifically by and for eating disordered people, I would swear it was that early 2000s chocolate x lax You were only meant to take one square, but when you take it nearly every day, you get a tolerance. Or maybe it's just that you get impatient for more and more dramatic results, because pretty soon you're eating seven or eight of the little bastards. It was a nice treat in a way, a few bites of chocolate, guilt-free, purge-free. But I don't recommend it. Above all things ED'd, I do not fucking recommend overdosing on laxatives. Never. You'll find yourself stuck in the utter hell of a full night of cramps that feel like razor wire shredding your intestines. And you can't leave the toilet because you never know when you'll shit your guts out. But you also can't just sit there because the cramps are so agonising you have to roll around on the floor to ease the agony. Feels like you're dying, literally, every single time. But, well, starve yourself and you don't really shit anymore. And if you're not shitting, then the scale doesn't go down because of the backed up poop weight. We talked all the time on the SP about the poop fairy, various ways to get her to visit you. Some people swore by coffee and a cigarette, others by sticking a finger up their ass for a few seconds. Personally, I say the best method is glutting yourself on blueberries, like a genuinely huge number of blueberries. They're low calorie and they will make you shit. 
But back then, even a blueberry binge would have been too much. So the dusty, medicinal pseudo-chocolate of x lax it was. The minute we got home, I reunited myself with a litre of ice cream and the familiar puke portal of our toilet bowl. Life rolled on, just as before, minus the four pounds I'd managed to lose on vacation, which took me right down to the goal weight that had haunted me since 1998. But it wasn't a celebration. It wasn't life-changing. I didn't have it in me to change my life. As summer faded into autumn, my mum kept nagging me to learn to drive like any normal teenager. I took the odd lesson, but I really didn't see the point of it all. It seemed an expense they shouldn't bother paying for, but I could hardly tell them why, could I? Why is there no point to you learning to drive? My mum pressed one afternoon. There just isn't. I stated flatly the way I stated everything back then. But you'll be able to go out and see your friends. There's no point, Mum. I won't be here. Where will you be? Nowhere. With that said, I sloped off up the stairs and disappeared. Discussing your desire for premature death with your own mother is about as awkward as it gets. But that was how I saw it. Why should they waste their money on me learning to drive when I probably wouldn't live long enough to pass my test? In retrospect, that's fucking stupid. However much you're planning for death, you should never quit preparing for life or living it. Because unfortunate shit can always happen. Unfortunate shit like surviving another 18 years and counting. Anyway, I did attempt recovery later that year. It's a whole story for that other book. I keep telling you I'll write. Didn't work. I relapsed just before Christmas, and that was basically 2004. Slipping further into bulimia, I did live to pass my driving test. Then I drove out to every big supermarket in a 10 mile radius to shoplift cheese and ice cream. I never enjoyed nicking food, by the way. That illicit rush people in movies talk about. I hated it personally. It was the uncertainty. Anyone could have suspected me, stopped me, and then it'd be hours before I'd get to binge. That was awful. But I couldn't afford my binge food habit, and when you can eat anything and not get fat, plus fixating on food 24-7, you tend to get a taste for the good shit, the expensive stuff. I had my technique down. No one ever side-eyed or stopped me, not even nicking litre tubs of ice cream. And if they did, well, I was fully prepared to throw my ED at them. I was visibly underweight, and I knew girls at the SP who'd been caught shoplifting food, pulled the bulimia card, then just been banned from the store. No charges brought. Who knows if I'd have been so lucky. I don't recommend banking on it. My binges were so big these days, my gluttony outstripped the size of my stomach, even the size of my bucket. It was too risky to use the toilet to puke in, in the evenings when everyone was home. So I'd just lay down newspaper and throw up into a bucket in my room, with television playing loudly to cover the noise. They were a band who never had any stupid quiet bits in their songs. You have to watch those fucking quiet bits. One badly timed gag and the gig's up. Parental room invasion while you still have thousands of calories inside you. No freaking way. Television every time. So I'd lay out all my food around me in a three-quarter circle like some pagan ritual or a comforting barrier from the entire world, everything in themed sections. Savoury, ranging from crisps to cheese to bowls of macaroni. Fudge was its own damn section. I had so much of the stuff. Mostly homemade to try out every flavour combo I could dream up. Then cakes, ranging from fresh cheesecake to packs of Mr Kipling cream-filled chocolate rolls or fresh eclairs. Ice cream and assorted creams. All manner of chocolates from white to dark or posh selections filled with raspberry ganache. And boy did I like to dip stuff. I dipped cheese in butter, I shit you not. Literally shoveling whole tablespoons of butter into my mouth atop every bite of smoked Bavarian cheese. And chocolates I'd shovel into clotted cream or marshmallow fluff or Nutella or peanut butter. White chocolate and PB were always the final mouthfuls of my binge, until the smell of white chocolate kind of made me feel nauseous all by itself. There is no way I ever would have had the stones to binge like that if I didn't know the SP girls did it first. 
they taught me the butter thing that you could genuinely eat pure butter and not gain weight if you knew how these things worked and these girls they had no guilt they felt no shame in the size of their binges so neither did i it became so normalized to us i was underweight and still losing why should i feel greedy gluttonous fat I'd cram it all in till I couldn't stuff in another mouthful. Then I'd vomit up just about everything into the bucket before using an empty yogurt pot to messily scoop the viscous puke from the bucket into a cut open two litre Coke bottle till I'd made enough room for the next purge. Then I'd sit back down right next to all the vomit and eat and eat and eat before purging properly, thoroughly. Carrying all that puke to the bathroom was a dangerous business with my family free ranging around the house. So sometimes it just had to stay in the room with me for an hour or three. Bulimia is glamorous as fuck when you don't have an ensuite. And boy, did I wish I had a fucking ensuite. At the SP, we had a new trend, a new thread. It was called binge food pictorials and everyone posted pictures of their binge food now. Food porn was a new concept back in 2004, and damn did we go for it. My old digicam ended up covered in sticky frosting and cake crumbs from taking pictures mid-binge, and I loved having those photos, so on my restriction days I could go back and browse all the deliciousness that had come yesterday and would come again tomorrow or the next day. I was so starved, so food obsessed, that on the nights before a binge purge day, I'd lie rigidly awake all night, heart hammering with excitement as I planned out every single food combination I'd try in the morning. And as soon as the alarm went, I'd shoot out of bed, grab my car keys and zoom off to whichever supermarket I was going to raid today. It was so much better having a car. My mum was right about that, but not for the reasons she thought. It was better because there was the anonymity to shoplift. And because you could get marshmallow fluff without an SP member having to mail it from America, and because there was no chance of running into family members at the local shops with a basket full of cheesecake, crisps, eclairs and all the rest when they knew full well I only ever ate salad, fruit and tofu. And that happened once or twice, any anorexic's worst nightmare. Thank God for my stepdad's lack of observational skills. But while all this was going on, while I was shedding the recovery weight and puking myself inside out, something else was entering my life too. Ash and I were still friends. We still hung out now and then at my place or his. And one weekend, he told me he was about to try ecstasy for the very first time with our old friend Jack and a new acquaintance, Ricky. Was I in? Did I fancy it? Duh, Ash. There'd never been a bigger no-brainer. I'd been fascinated by drugs since I was a child, born with a self-destructive streak. Would have gladly taken heroin at 13 had it been available to me, but drugs harder than weed had simply never crossed my path. And since breaking up with Ash, I didn't even have that. No dealer, no contacts at all. The typical downsides to being an antisocial autistic anorexic. But I still had Ash, and he was never the antisocial type. Everything was about to change. So I said yes, in a heartbeat. That Saturday night, I got a lift over to Ash's place, our old place, where I found him, Jack, and our new acquaintance Ricky waiting. He was the one with the pills, which were white bearing a star logo on one side, and what appeared to be a score line on the back, but that we later realised said Heineken in tiny, tiny letters. Ricky had dark, curly hair, looked younger than his age, was half Italian with the big, dark eyes to prove it, and despite not being remotely my skinny goth boy type, he turned out to be oddly endearing in this clumsy, hapless, open sort of way. As young as he looked, though, Ricky clearly knew a lot more about the world than we did. He could get just about anything when it came to drugs. The pills, he said, only cost him 75p each. He knew the guy who pressed them, pure as anything and cheap as chips to his good mate, Ricky. The kid clearly had quite the talent for finding himself usefully placed in life, or so it seemed. There was a lot about Ricky that we would someday realise wasn't quite what it seemed, but who was to know that?
right then. All we saw was that open smile, the cute little chip in his front tooth from constantly chewing his librette stud while high on pills, the big dark eyes and easy Italian charm. No one knew yet what the fuck lurked behind all of that, and no one would, not until it was far, far too late. As I sat next to Ash, curled up in his lap like usual, like we'd never been apart, the unknown quantity in our midst dropped a star-embossed pill into each of our hands. Jack was the only one to pass up this golden opportunity, choosing to stick with weed. Ash and I curled up in that hideous floral armchair, still marked with a smudge of my blood, courtesy of the big mess incident, grinned at each other and gulped down our pills with a swig of Diet Coke. That was when Ricky said, You probably shouldn't have done that. He was staring straight at me, looking me up and down, frowning as he added, I weigh 14 stone. You're what, half of that? I just shrugged. No one, Ash in particular, needed to know precisely how far under seven stone I presently was. Less than seven, Ricky deduced, and he wasn't smiling now. Oh shit, these things are strong even for me. You really, really shouldn't have taken the whole thing in one go. Everyone looked at each other. I think Ash even suggested trying to throw it back up before it was too late. But I wasn't having that. Ricky had just given us all the pills he had, and I wanted this experience. I never really grasped the concept of danger, not in my eating disorder, not in my self-harm, or my horse riding, or driving, or, well, in this. That pill had looked so innocuous, so small and white and harmless. How could something so small really be a danger? Who knew? That was the fun of ecstasy back in the day before internet test kits. You never know what you've put in your body or how much until it kicks in and potentially kicks you right off the planet. Were we headed to heaven or the hospital? No one knew and frankly, I didn't even care. I didn't expect much to happen if I'm honest. It's like I said, the pill just looked so small. It never looked like it could hurt me. None of us knew a thing about the stuff. But more to the point, no one knew what the fuck was really lurking inside the cute, dark-eyed acquaintance sitting at our side. Half an hour then, said Ricky, checking his watch. You'll feel it in half an hour. And I felt like that would be a really annoying place to stop, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, also, we've kind of reached the length of a chapter, so without throwing in the whole of everything that was to come later that night... I kind of had to leave the chapter break there. But uh, I have written way ahead of this chapter because this is the bit I really wanted to get to. This is the fun bit for me, even though not all of it was good and I have more dark secrets to tell you um, about a lot of stuff. Uh, nonetheless, it's, it's the bit I've been wanting to write about. So I've written about the next three chapters or something. Therefore, the next chapter will be coming up soon and uh, we'll tell you everything that happened that night and onwards uh, with all of this, with sliding into my raver phase and um, Ricky, who Ricky really was, what he really was. Um, and uh, I have a feeling anyone who knows me and knows my circle already identified who <laughs> who Ricky is obviously it's a fake name it's another fake name but there is a lot to say about uh everything that would go down once he entered our world me and Ash um yeah so anyway if you missed any chapters and you would like to catch up or any of that I will leave the playlist as ever linked below and if you would like to see the next chapter early then my Patreon is linked below. You can become a member for just two dollars plus a smidge of your local sales tax and that will mean you will get the next chapter early and advert free and uncensored and all of that stuff. No annoying interruptions or anything so if you want to use it as a bedtime story and uh, fall asleep to it you're not going to get an advert yelling in your ear halfway through. Um, so uh, Patreon if you fancy it but uh, otherwise I will see you again with the next chapter probably in about a week uh, because I am excited to get to it so uh, 
yay, yay, yay. But thank you very much for being with me on this journey. And I hope you continue to stick with me as we go on through the raver years, which were the craziest, some of the best and worst and craziest times of my life. And uh, I'm really excited to bring you with me. So uh, I hope you fancy sticking around and uh, seeing me at the next chapter, which, yeah, will probably be in about a weekish. Uh, so I will see you then and I'm going to go away and open a friggin' window now because it is hot in here. So uh, thanks for listening over and out. Bye bye. <laughs>